So again, my name is Betsy Sapulo. I'm a clinical nurse for the Nova Alexandria Hospital. I currently hold certification in inpatient OB since now, don't, don't freak out, 1990 and electronic fetal monitoring since 2008. Everybody, when they hear that, is going, I wasn't even born yet. It's like, okay, I can be your grandma. Down in dirty labs, what do all the numbers mean? Because you do know that nothing ever happens in OB. Everybody looks at our area as, oh, you get to play with babies. Moms are having babies. Yay. Okay. Probably 70%. We could maybe throw into that category. But that other 30% are as what we commonly refer to as the train wrecks the problems, the complications. Okay, that's a new screen. It says BS7. Okay. We'll take that away. Yeah, that's okay. my fault. I'm giving, I'll give you whatever you want. I know you will, but I, you know, I don't I'll want people to, you. you know, I'm, I'm a diploma grad, Geisinger Medical Center School of Nursing. Well, then we'll be a DS. Yeah. It, I don't think we're even an AD then either. It was 50 years ago. We didn't have that. Well, it was the only way you could get a, get a end of nursing. And it didn't change the date either, but you know okay. what? It's all the same and it's the yeah. same link and it's the same thing. I didn't want to mislead it. Okay, this is that disclosure thing that we have to put up there. All right, so what are we going to do today? We're going to look at the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. These are the largest amount of... I don't think we need to put this on airplane. The largest diagnoses that you are going to face, and it is also the most complicated. We're going to look at what's normal and abnormal. When you are pregnant, you cannot look at the labs like you do for everybody else because pregnancy changes your whole profile and picture. Okay? Pregnancy, let's look at cardiovascular. You know your cardiac output increases by 48%. When you're pushing, 80%. Think of the patient with an unknown cardiac lesion, now pregnant from country of origin, who got limited, if not no prenatal care, and you have her start pushing and she goes into heart failure. Everybody's looking at me going, huh? Yes, it's happening. So you've got to know what are the changes that occur? What does the body make happen? that makes our life more difficult. You know, when you look at a lab value on the right, it says normal lab values. That's the adult male. I don't know anybody in this room that if they've been pregnant or gonna be pregnant or whatever is gonna fall in that category. Things change. We're gonna look at our nursing interventions and we're gonna actually show, show some safety issues. So hypertension in pregnancy. When I started, this was called toxemia. That substance in the blood. That definition is not far off. And I think it was 2012, the perinatologists, the big gurus, came up with the four categories you see. Because prior to this, we were not taking care of the patient properly. Everybody was doing their own thing. So they came up with the four categories to better define our care. It's been a long process. It's been over 10 years. We're getting there, but we still haven't reached optimal care yet. So we have gestational hypertension, chronic hypertension, preeclampsia. Yes, ma'am. I got to go back over here. It's fine. To give somebody a fetal monitoring test. 
Have fun. Eat and cross them too. Two. SOS. Send somebody to come get me. Okay. Y'all heard that? Because if something happens here, I'm not touching it. So we had preeclampsia with severe features, eclampsia. I will tell you that preeclampsia with severe features pretty much is health syndrome. Um, superimposed preeclampsia or eclampsia on top of chronic hypertension. This thing is talking over here. Okay, just want to make sure nobody's sending anything. Even if they do, I won't know what to do with it. <laughs> Significance affects minimally at least 5% of all pregnancies in the United States. I think that number has gone up. Fetal growth restriction is common. Why? That placenta is not functioning. Nutrients can't get across it to get to the baby. Because remember, nutrients cross by that passive diffusion, higher to lower gradients. Well, if you've got a blood pressure that's so sky high and intermittent because it's not consistent, you know, it's not like a pulse ox where we can see the, the um, you want to call it a tracing of what that mom's pulse rate is doing. I wish we had the ability to do the same thing with the blood pressure because it spikes all over the place. Please do not say to a patient that this is fetal growth retardation. There's nothing wrong with this baby's brain. It is restriction. But that was an old term. You might still hear some of the older ones, older docs saying that. Don't say that to the mom. Her baby's okay as far as the brain goes that we know. Second only to our friend, the embolitic events as a cause of mortality. Yes, women still know die in pregnancy. In my career, I've had eight. Predisposes to our friend abruption, DIC, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema. Abruption, remember that's that abrupt, usually contraction to the uterus, causes the placenta to prematurely separate. Uh, DIC, well, that when you're going down that garden path, you're in big time trouble. Congestive heart failure, because remember, the heart's not functioning as well as we would like it due to the physiologic overload that's going on. And then you throw pulmonary edema in there. You get leaky vessels. And where do they leak into? The lung fields. They sound like a washing machine. You can stand at the door and hear their lungs sound. You don't need a stethoscope because it can get that bad. It has increased by 25% in the United States over the past two decades. It is still a major contributor to prematurity. Why? We're going to get that baby out because it'll do better on the outside than in. It is a major risk factor for food to cardiovascular and metabolic disease in women. I will tell you, cardiovascular disease, i.e. hypertension, and diabetes, I call them the kissing cousins. If you see one, look for the other because they go hand in hand. We still don't know the exact cause, like the infection causes the white count to go up and you have um, um, the causative organism. We still don't have that kind of an algorithm to say, this is what causes preeclampsia. We've got some pretty good ideas and we're getting closer. But because of the differentiation, we still haven't translated in to optimal care. The rate of adverse outcomes has more than doubled from 2007 to 2019. The rate of preeclampsia backslash gestational hypertension, there were 38 per thousand deliveries in 2007, 78 per thousand in 2019. Also, you've heard in the news, I mean, I don't care what you do, but we still hear mortality. It's more than doubled in the last 30 years with glaring disparities between black and white patients. Black women are three times more likely to die than white. And I'm sure y'all have Hulu, watch Aftershock and get a box of tissues out. 
It shows the reality of what we are dealing with. Gestational hypertension. This is the patient that all of a sudden I'm getting a blood pressure reading 140 over 90 and it's after the 20th week of gestation. The key point after 20 weeks, because if it's before 20 weeks, what is it? Chronic, excellent. By the way, y'all can raise your hand, shout out answers, okay? We participate. There is no what we call diagnostic protein in the urine. There may be protein there, but it hasn't hit the criteria to call it preeclampsia. So you may have a PCR of 0.1. You may see a 24-hour collection that says, 137 milligrams of protein. It's there, but it's not greater than 300. Do you see? Blood pressure goes back to normal at the 12th week. We call it white cone syndrome. Let's face it, you don't take that first blood pressure when they come in the door because they are late 20 minutes for their appointment and they're huffing and puffing due to the traffic on 395. <laughs> I didn't want to be late. Hey, you go check that girl's blood pressure. I'm certainly not. I'm going to talk to her for a little bit, get her calmed down, and see what that true reading is. Also, be very careful reading prenatals. I love our peers who are the medical assistants, but take a good look at them. Here they are 100 over 70, 110 over 70, um, 100 over 60. Well, what happened to 128 over 72? They give us these round numbers. So just be careful when reviewing prenatals. 25 to 50% of the women with gestational hypertension will go on to preeclampsia. It's kind of like a precursor. We're setting the stage, pay attention to this mom. 44% of the women with gestational or our friend preeclampsia, we've made the diagnosis, who's been managed expectantly, will go on to experience it with severe features, our friend health syndrome, pulmonary edema, and let's not forget postpartum hemorrhage. Chronic hypertension. Blood pressure is 140 over 90 on that first visit to confirm the pregnancy. And I can Excuse me. I can tell you how many times that I hear the midwives telling me, yeah, she came in and we said, hey, your blood pressure is like 146 over 98. Right hand up to God. That's this one. Well, patients tell all sorts of stuff to their providers and especially people like me. I, they think they're on the grandmother. They'll say, well, you know, I had blood pressure problems about four years ago. They put me on medicine and it got better. So we stopped the medicine. This is what people say. The thing to remember, it predates the pregnancy. It's going to keep lasting beyond the 12th week postpartum. 40% will go on to develop our friend preeclampsia. And it most, it's the most complicated type because we're already starting with a not normal slate. We're already starting with people that may have a compromised renal function. You don't know because I'm sure everybody in this room sees their doctor every six months, right? You're lucky if you show up once a year and that's for birth control. You have a 10 minute office visit. They do one quick blood pressure. How you doing? Have a nice day. You're out the door. You've got your script. It's not like that full workup chemistries, um, you know, better history taking. You're not seeing that anymore in our care. Here's our big problem child, preeclampsia. Now, I'm gonna go down here. So it's divided into two categories, blood pressure and protein. 
but you will see that preeclampsia, the blood pressure part is split out even further. When they were doing the research, because this all came from a document called Hypertension, published by our peers in the physician world called ACOC. And it was to be the guidelines for the docs to follow. So what they saw is that people ignored the blood pressure. Oh, it's not that bad. Turn her on her side. Because we don't want to recognize that this group of ladies is in serious trouble. They need immediate attention. Oh, she's just pregnant. You will hear this. It's one of the reasons why we have such disparities. Because they're not paying attention to us. Okay? So they broke it out. 140 over 90 after the 20th week with a woman with normal blood pressures. But then you see the 160 over 110. You get 160 over 110. And 10 minutes later, you're still looking at that level. You get on the phone, you get your provider, you get orders. You need to treat the blood pressure. You're in stroke range. And anybody that's seen a pregnant woman stroke out, it is not pretty. But that's okay. She's 16 years old. She's healthy. Blow that out of your minds. She's sick. We have a problem. Move. The other thing is our friends in the healthcare insurance business are now reviewing how well do we respond. Just like the patients when they're having a heart attack coming in the ER, what's the first thing they give them? Aspirin. They are, how do I want to say, their reactions are measured. Are you doing the right thing fast? Guess what, guys? We're being measured as well. We have to act. And you're calling the physician. Remember, I love my midwives. Midwives treat low-risk patients. Is she low-risk? So you want the blood pressure, either category and proteinuria. Now, when this first came out, we all looked at it and said, why are we including a dipstick? How many here are going to do advanced practice nursing after a couple of years when you get your degrees? Your advanced practice degrees, I mean, you're all BSNs anyway. Like midwives, nurse practitioners. Nobody? You're going to stay at the hospital bedside? Yes. I'm being replaced. Yay. Well, we looked at that and we're like, why? And I, and I sat there and looked at it. And I said, well, you're in South Dakota and an Indian reservation. Do you have an ANOVA medical system nearby? No. Your nearest hospital might be four hours away. But you have Walmart. And guess what a bottle of dipsticks costs at Walnut? Last time I looked, I think it was like three something. You can dip that woman's urine. Dipstick of one plus, if other methods not available, that should send your alarm bells up. But what we use in the hospital are, you'll hear me say PCR or protein creatinine ratio and 24-hour urine. Now understand, our docs understand a 24-hour urine like nobody's business because you're collecting it in the jug for 24 hours. Those of us that are old, and can remember back in the day when we dipped everybody's urine every time they peed? If you plotted it out on a chart, the morning might be two plus, 10 o'clock is one plus, lunch is trace, maybe zero, maybe one plus. Everything depended on how well that kidney was filtering. So you had all sorts of dipstick readings out there. That's why they understand a 24-hour urine because it's a cumulative measurement. PCRs, you got to be careful, and I'll have a slide up to explain why, but you got to be careful. Oh, thank you, God. See me like I'm like in a, in a panic here trying to get the little thing to work. 
Okay, in the absence of proteinuria, because guess what? When you're below 34 weeks, it may show up as an atypical presentation. So it doesn't hit the category of blood pressure and proteinuria. Any of the following, if they are present, thrombocytopedia, platelet count less than 100,000. What's a normal platelet count in pregnancy? Shout it out. Okay, we're already in trouble because you don't know what's normal in pregnancy. Remember, you're in a different world now. And as a point of information, yeah, you're in women's right now, but maybe some of you will go on to ICU. Maybe some of you will go on to renal. Maybe some of you will go on to a different specialty. Know the numbers for that specialty because OB is different. This thing's making noise. Oh. So a normal platelet count is 150,000 or above. But if you look on that little side thing on the labs, it's a different number, but you're pregnant. Renal insufficiency, that's when we measure the serum creatinine. 1.1 or a doubling of the initial serum creatinine noted in pregnancy in the absence of renal disease. So what's a normal serum creatinine? Anybody? You're too high. 0.6. You might even see a few that are 0.3 because the kidneys are functioning. There's no insult. But your chronic hypertension walking in the door that's never been treated might be 0.9. So when it says doubling, your starting point you know now is 0.9. So you're going to go higher. Impaired liver function. What's a normal ALT, AST? And any of us back in the old days remember that as SGOT, SGPT. <clears throat> 35. So doubling would be what? What's our danger zone? Anything above 70. Pulmonary edema. When these girls have edema, like I said, you can stand at the doorway and hear them. They are gurgling. They are coughing. Cerebral visual symptoms. Blurry vision, spots before the eyes. Why do you think they have cerebral changes? What's going on? Can you see everybody's edema? No. And the scariest ones were the ones you couldn't see. When we did suctions back in the day, we used to call them dry toxemics. We'd go in to get the babies and we'd have two and three liters of acidic fluid sitting in the belly because that's where she was third spacing her fluid. The patient that walks in that looks like the Michelin tire man. Those of us that have been starting IVs for 50 years, our challenges are even further tested with those girls because they start and they're swollen at least an inch more circumference on their arms. Yes, I've put IVs in feet, but sometimes when you see them, they look like little dinosaur feet. They're so swollen. Edema used to be a criteria to diagnose preeclampsia. That went by the wayside a long time ago because, like I said, some of the sickest patients was the edema you didn't see. So cerebral edema, that headache that is unrelenting, where do you think the edema's at? Exactly. And I will tell you, the early warning sign of brain edema, when they've got swelling, they have a change in their mentation. They're sleepy. They're not acting right. Those are the scary ones. And when they do have an eclamptic seizure and we've done MRIs, it is complete white out on the brain. Now, what do I mean? It looks like someone took chalk and covered over the picture because you cannot see any defining structures because the edema is so bad. There's no more severe 
eclamp, preeclampsia, it's severe features, but you'll still hear the doc say the other term. Multi-system pro process, kidneys, um, brain, cardiac, renal. And you can have one, two, three, all four. It just depends on how sick she is. Progressive at different rates. Everyone in this room could be pregnant and everyone in this room will show preeclampsia different. And at different gestational ages. The key word here is the earlier in gestation that this happens, the more severe it will be. So the girl at 24 weeks is more sick than that 34 weeker. Not to say that the 34 weeker isn't sick, but if she's developing into 24 weeks, we have a serious problem on our hands. Also, one thing that I'm going to go back and add to this if we have more than one placenta, the placenta is the problem. So if you've got twins, triplets, quads, the more placental tissue you have, the more problem you're going to have. Women who deliver at 34 weeks due to preeclampsia have an eight to nine fold increase to develop cardiovascular disease later in life. ACOG published cardiovascular disease in women, I'm going to say in 20, I think it was 2015 or 2016. You do realize in the InnovaNet system, you can go into the library and read the technical bulletins for ACOG and A1, free to you. Learn how to use that process. Also, our friend in the computer, up to date. Up to date on OB issues are reviewed every three months. Our Dr. Gadini has contributed, I know, to at least four of them. Um, at the top, it's driven by a gentleman named Charlie Lockwood. Exceptional. Um, but every three months, they do a major lit search and address it and update it in up to date for you to be able to review. And it's at your fingertips on the top of the, um, the stat, you know, in Epic on the status board. You can get into it real easy. Anyway. That technical bulletin stated, <laughs> if you are diagnosed and delivered prior to 34 weeks, after discharge, you need to be followed by a cardiologist the rest of your life. Now, how many here on discharge see that that appointment is set up? It's not. We have a whole month devoted to cardiovascular disease in women in February, red dress. But we're still not taking care of ourselves. When the cardiovascular disease in women document came out, I started asking my docs, are you making these appointments? Are you sending them to these doctors? No. 2019. A woman named Connie Grace, she is an excellent perinatologist. You ever get the chance to go hear her, go hear her. She talks about something called the fourth trimester. It's what happens after we deliver because pregnancy is a look into our future. If you're diagnosed with, pre, uh, with diabetes, you have a greater than 50% chance of being diabetic the rest of your life and the baby. But do we pay attention to that? No, we're in the current now. Preeclampsia, they should be followed by a cardiovascular or a cardiac doctor. Connie kept sending her patients to her friend who was a, cardio, a cardiac doctor. The, pa the doctor calls Dr. Graves and says, why do you keep sending me these women? Because that is the standard we need to meet. She's doing the right thing. Till that cardiac doctor was on call in the ER one night and a 56-year-old African-American woman came in with off-the-chain blood pressures and they called her to evaluate and see the patient. I don't know what made the woman ask her, but she said, have you, did you have preeclampsia with any of your children? Oh, yes. 
I delivered my one baby at 28 weeks and my second baby at 30. Bingo, made sense now. But are we taking care of ourselves as women? Even the histories in your prenatals, I asked the midwives and the docs, when you get a new patient and she's 53 years old, do you ask her what her deliveries were like? Did she have gestational diabetes? Did she have preeclampsia? The information is not there to be able to be gathered. We think that preeclampsia is not the cause, but rather shares the same risk factors. We think the endothelial damage that occurs to the lining of the vessels due to preeclampsia, because remember, the esplit and endogalin punch holes in the cardiovascular system, causing fluid to leak out. We see it as edema. Well, whenever you have a tear, when a tear heals, it creates scar tissue, yes? Scar tissue is like a red flag being raved. Come see me. Where do you think the plaque and the atherosclerosis attached to? Make sense? They also have a higher level of LDL um, and a much longer persistence to insulin resistance. Remember I said these two are kissing cousins. We like to get these ladies delivered by 37 weeks unless they present sicker earlier. That's when MFM gets involved and says, yeah, cut your losses, get the baby out. Women with preeclampsia who have general anesthesia. Now, why would she have general anesthesia? What would be the reasons, labor and delivery? Let's go. That C-section. What else? How high do your platelets have to be for regional anesthesia? How high for anesthesia? Different ball game. Anesthesia, the old guys will go down to a platelet count of 80 to put in regional. Yes, 150 is normal, but if she has a platelet count of 50, we are not putting a spinal or an epidural in. <laughs> the reason being, when they put either the needle or the catheter in, what's the first thing they do? They pull back. Do we have any blood? No, we can advance and put meds in. But if they hit a vessel in your back and you have a platelet count of 50, are you going to be able to clot? Better yet, can you see it? At least when your vein blows, you can see that big puffy mess. But in your back, you have no way of knowing it. It's not bleeding out of the hole. It's bleeding in her dural, epidural space or her spinal cord. You won't see it. Um, so I had preclampsia when I gave birth to my first baby. And um, my platelets were at 73, and that actually happened to me. <laughs> so when they did my epidural, they didn't, they went through a blood vessel. They didn't realize it because I was like, you know, I'm in the back and I was just bleeding out. Okay. But I'm going to say, nothing ever happens to the B. <laughs> Get my drift, ladies. And I apologize if there's any gentlemen on the, 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 the thing. All right, so the answer's right up there. Platelets may be below 80,000, unable to do regional because now some of the newer guys, they're even more nervous. They won't go below 100. But some of the older ones with, you know, they're really comfortable with their technique will do it at 80. Here's also another thing. Even under normal circumstances without, <laughs> normal circumstances without, any complication, we go to innovate, spikes their blood pressure up. Okay, you're in the OR with already a 180 over 112 blood pressure and you're tubing someone, guess where that pressure goes to? But that's okay, because nothing ever happens in our world. Here's the creepy thing. 
Preeclampsia can occur four to six weeks after delivery, up to four to six weeks, usually eight to 12 days. These are the ones that come into the ER with an intractable headache. Well, if you're diagnosed with preeclampsia in the postpartum period, you got to go to the floor and get on mag. We don't know why it's happening because even though we delivered her, it's not necessarily the cure. One of the theories, and key word here is theory. Well, it goes up to four to six weeks. Well, what happens around six weeks? What happens to us as women? What about our cycles? If we're starting our menstrual cycle again. Now, what do we know about menstrual cycle? It cleans us out. When you deliver, little micro fragments are still embedded in the uterine lining. Do you think that that could still be influencing on what's going on in our bodies that we develop postpartum preeclampsia? Here's the other scary thing. We've had deliveries go off, no gestational hypertension, no preeclampsia, nothing. 120 over 60 blood pressure. There's nothing there to say preeclampsia. And they come in on a Sunday afternoon while they were breastfeeding their baby in bed, having a eclamptic seizure to the ER by rescue squad. And as luck would have it, I had done this presentation to a group of nursing students the one young gentleman that was in the group happens to work in the ER to get more experience as a clinic tech. She was all of five foot tall, this big, full blown eclamptic seizure. And everybody there is doing all this. Nobody put two and two together. And the young man, when he was talking to the husband, you know, the husband's explaining she was breastfeeding. We had our baby. He's trying to tell the doctor that this is an eclamptic seizure. She had a baby. What do you know? You're just a tech. Until grandma comes in with the baby in the carrier, because remember, this is pre-COVID, so babies would still come into the hospital. And they finally came up with oh my God, it's an eclamptic seizure. And plus her pressure was sky high. She was a little bitty thing because I could pick her up off the stretcher and put her on the bed. That's how tiny she was. And her pressure was 160 over 110, higher than that. I won't tell you what they brought her up running. They had done a concoction of magnesium sulfate in a 500 cc bag from the pharmacy. And I went, what's this? Because they didn't want a fluid overloader what you don't realize is that in preeclampsia or eclampsia, they third space the fluid out of their circulation that if you did a CBC, she's heme concentrated. So they need fluid centrally because we say that they are centrally dry. They've pushed the fluid out, but we'll talk a little more later. So we're not 100% sure, but we think that might be the reason why it happens. But like I said, we've had people come in, no signs or symptoms. That's where Epic comes in real handy because we go back and look at what the blood pressure and what the lab work was doing. There is no clinically validated strategy or test to predict preeclampsia. Now, I know some of my experienced nurses on the this thing are probably saying, well, what about that new test that just came out? And what it is, it kind of reminds me, at least in the stuff that I've read, um, it kind of acts like a fetal fibronectin does as far as test results go. Fetal fibronectin is a better negative than positive prediction of whether you'll go into preterm labor over the next two weeks. So what it is, is we swab the sacred space, we send the swab down, 
If it's negative, they have a 98% chance of not going into labor. If it's positive, they have a 60% chance, but then you have to look at gestational age and cervical length. The problem with a fetal fibronectin is we only know what a normal cervical length is up to 28 weeks. After that, it's anybody's guess. The new preeclampsia test looks at the elements of S-flit, S-flit and one other. They look at the, the numbers. If it's 40 keeps running in my brain, if it's above or below, if I think if it's above, you have, if it's below, you have, it's, it's considered negative that you will not develop preeclampsia in the next two weeks, but if it's above it, you can. The MFMs are still not moving on this test. They want more data. They want more information. I am sure by when they come for their big annual meeting in February of 24, we will have more information. I spoke with Dr. Scott Sullivan. He's head of MFM for the Inova system. And he says, Betsy, we're still waiting on it. We want to see more data because it may not change our practice. You know, do we want to do something? Although we, we do have a few physicians that might need it to help them figure out what to do. Um, but as at this moment, we, we do not have it available in Inova. These are how it happens. Now, the next few slides are different ways to look at it. One of the things I learned in doing this class is everybody has a different way of learning. Some people have to have the paper to touch it. That's me. And write notes, okay? Some people, it goes in their brain. Some people like algorithms. Some people, that's me. I'm an algorithm girl. Some people like a different way to present the data. So the next few slides is pretty much that. But our friend Esselin and Dottlin are the problems. We overproduce them because the placenta didn't go in and do its form the way it should have. And Esselin and Dottlin get out into the circulation and that's what causes the problems in, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in our vasculature, causes the leaky vessels. Then you've got the platelets coming into play, fibrinogen, all that stuff. And, it, and in fact, that new test, I know it looks at uh, S-flit uh, and one of the other factors. I'll have to double check it, but I know S-flit is one of them. But basically, it triggers an inflammatory process, release of cytokines, and everything goes down the tubes real fast. Baby aspirin. We started using it in 2015. <coughs> Who gets it? Well, we had a practice at Alex that basically gave it to every single one of their patients because they didn't want anything happening. But high risk, <coughs> if there's a history uh, of prior preeclampsia, twins, triplets, chronic hypertension, one or Types one or two, diabetes, kidney disease, lupus. And no parity is the moderate, obesity, family history, social, I mean, that's a whole thing to consider. Previously uncomplicated, they don't want you to, because we don't want to also crowd the data. But I can guarantee you if that low risk one takes a turn, she will get baby aspirin in the next pregnancy. Ah, uh, here's our friend, COVID-19. We will not see the end of this probably in your lifetime. When we talk about diabetes, everybody says, oh, it's hereditary. One more thing in there, it's also environmental. And by environmental, has there been some sort of an insult to the pancreas, i.e. a virus? 
We are going to see, we are already starting to see more type one in adults, because usually you hear type one, it's the diabetes of a child, you know, teenagers. The young lady I interviewed yesterday, um, she's a type one on a pump with a CGM, very interesting young lady. And I said, any family history? Absolutely none. When did you die, get diagnosed? 18 years ago, okay? She said, my doctor in University of Washington out on the West Coast basically said to her that when she was 18, she had pneumonia. And that's when they died, uh, shortly after, that's when they diagnosed it. We're going to see more of it. COVID also affects the cardiac muscle. COVID also affects the kidneys. It just depends on where the virus wants to play and attack. We have not seen the end of it. Women with COVID are significantly more likely to develop preeclampsia. That's why we want them to get the shots. Additionally, a significant increase in the development of preeclampsia with severe features was noted. Do you want these sick puppies on your unit? Research further indicated a three-week interval between infection and the development of preeclampsia. COVID proteins interact with the proteins involved with vital placental uh, function, possibly leading to interactions that could be involved with preeclampsia, such as the trophoblast invasion, migration, proliferation. Not fun. It upregulates esalen and dogalin, vasoconstricted peptides, nitric oxide modulators, thrombophytic related molecules, impacting the pathways. So it attacks everything that preeclampsia basically is caused. Again, these are the different pathophys. Like I said, everybody looks at it differently. So it's there for you to review. Also this one, again, another way, like I said, people learn differently. I want to give you as much information and we have such a large group, so we're meeting everybody's needs. An important thing you want to remember is our friend colloid osmotic pressure. Colloid osmotic pressure is what keeps the fluid in the vasculature. So if you're not pregnant, your, C, your COP will run around 25, but look at your antepartum. Postpartum, you drop to 15. But look at our pregnant preeclamptic and look at our postpartum preeclamptic. What it says is that moms lose fluid into the tissue. So in, I think it was Brazil, they said, well, let's give all our mothers Lasix. It did nothing. Because remember, you have to have fluid in the vasculature to be able to get it out of the kidneys. If it's in the tissue, it ain't going to go out. So be aware. Are they cutting grass out there? They must be. <laughs> be aware that your colloid osmotic. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but I I think you're muted. I can't, none of us in the um, 
chat can hear anything. Yeah, someone muted Betsy. Hello. Okay. I didn't touch that. I don't know if can you hear me now? I feel like the Verizon commercial. Yeah, Somebody, yes, we can hear you. Did you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't touch anything. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to this. So call out osmotic pressure. You wanna know what's going on as far as what's going on with your ladies and it explains why they're leaking out all over the place. But you also wanna know what your mean arterial pressure is, which comes across as part of your blood pressure reading. Um, and now what's it doing? Okay. Um, which in pregnancy, you want it above 70. If it's 65 or 60, mom is not perfusing. And when mom doesn't perfuse, guess who else doesn't perfuse? The baby is hypoxic if she is pregnant still. Okay, now if I do that, does that mute anything again? Nope, it's okay. So can we prevent it? Baby aspirin, it works. It, it decreases this decidual inflammation that occurs when the placenta implants, which is why you're doing it around 16 weeks. I had a young lady years ago came in. I can still tell you what room she was in, room seven on our unit. And it said in her note she was on baby aspirin. Known chronic hypertensive. She's like in her mid-20s. And I said, okay, and you're, what, what time did you take your baby aspirin? And she looked at me because I'm doing the admission. You want to put for whatever. Oops. Yep, I did it. Okay. Sorry, boss. Okay, what else can go wrong? Thank you so much. Um, and I said to her, I was doing her admission. So what time did you take it? Because, you know, we want to keep her on the same schedule. And she said, I'm, I'm not taking baby aspirin. I said, right here, your midwife recommended it. But I don't have a headache. 26 weeks. I'm so sorry. 26 weeks was never on it. Sky high pressures. We delivered her two weeks later because she got so sick. Because I said to I said to her, you didn't take it? She said, no, because I didn't have pain. I didn't have a headache. That's what her mindset was. She didn't understand what it does, that it decreases that inflammation at the site to reduce the release of the cytokines um, to prevent the 
formation of preeclampsia. So long story short, guess who came back uh, probably about three years ago down in antenatal where I was work where I'm working now. And she walks in and she and the, before I even said a word, she's like, I'm taking my baby aspirin. Now she said at 24, well, I'll, I'll take it now. I said, honey, the horse is out of the barn. No good at that point. I'm sorry. Okay. So we're starting it at 16 weeks. It came out of the ASPRI trial. In women with a high risk for uh, preeclampsia, and especially if they're a little on the, and this is my polite way of saying it, a little on the fluffy side, you do two baby aspirin, 162, to decrease it as yeah, the rate by as much as 30% in comparison to the 81. And that came out of the Society of Perinatology in February of 22. Now, the other thing we did was, there was a study also at that meeting that looked at among the pregnant women meeting high or moderate risk for baby aspirin, only 15% of these women were recommended to take baby aspirin. And guess where that study was done? The Henry Ford Medical System in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, excuse me, has a high black and brown population. So why weren't these women on baby aspirin? 15%? And yet they wonder why there are disparities. 39% of all patients with preeclampsia will have hypertension. 20% will have, have proteinuria for three months at least in the postpartum period. Additionally, 10 to 15% will continue to have proteinuria up to one year. Can you think of the patient that you're going to have a big problem with? How about the Irish twins? We delivered her first baby at 27 weeks due to severe preeclampsia, and she's pregnant again at five months. The baby's five months old. So how are we going to differentiate what's going on in this woman? Development is a major risk factor for cardiomyopathy. How many in this room can put on an EKG? Raise those hands, be proud. If you don't, go to your preceptor, mentor, whatever we're calling them today, to have her teach you how, because we're seeing more. Probably due to hypertensive issues, but the other problem is diabetes, and let's not forget COVID. COVID is attacking the heart muscle. We haven't seen all the details yet, but you've got to pay attention. Because when a woman walks in, short of breath, can't even walk down the hall, sats are low, a whole mess of things, what's, what's one of the first things we say? Oh, because you're just pregnant. This is normal for pregnancy. We can't say that anymore. We got to work these moms up. How many here know what a normal ejection factor is on an EKG or an echo? In a pregnant mom, you want it greater than 65%. Because now we have functioning cardiac tissue. Increased risk for end-stage renal disease, especially if mom has delivered and she has oliguria or the real bad one, anuria. Translation, no P. We had a 16-year-old a couple years back who, of course, guess who walks on on a Saturday morning? And the first thing my buddy, <laughs> who's the charge nurse, says, this one's yours. I walk in, the girl can't open her eyes. She's so swollen. She has not peed in almost 30 hours. I walk right out and I said, I need a bed in the ICU. 
She needs dialysis. Now, she had delivered Thursday night. This was Saturday morning. There's no pee. Can't, couldn't even take the tube and milk it with a med cup to get the 30 cc's. There was none. Then we found out at Alex, because we no longer have a pediatric certificate, because we don't have a peds unit, she cannot be admitted to the ICU because she's 16 years of age. She has to come to Fairfax. I, I about lost it over the phone with the, uh, the nursing supervisor, who's also a good friend. And I said, you have got to be friggin' kidding me. Now we have to get her transferred over to the mothership. And they're like, well, uh, yeah. the, the pediatric unit wouldn't take her because we don't do this, mag sulfate and all. So we ended up putting her on the adult ICU unit at Fairfax on dialysis. Her serum creatinine was four point something. What's the normal one in pregnancy? Point six. Because she was, she, they had given her a short run of mag, so all the mag is still in her system because she can't pee it out because that's where it comes out through the kidneys. So her mag level was sky high. So <laughs> the doctor over there says, well, you need to give her calcium gluconate. And I went, nope. And the ICU transport nurse that was standing next to me, she said, we don't transport if you push the calcium gluconate before we go, we have to wait another 30 minutes. And then some med student jumps up and says, I'm going to give it. I looked at him and I said, sit down. No, you're not. <laughs> because you get these jocks that want to like push it. No, these women have to remember what, what affects your cardiac muscle the most? Calcium. So you want to give it very slow, very meticulous with an EKG running. So I literally, I said to the doctor, if you want to give it, here it is. You're going to give it over this set rate. Here's a watch. And this is how slow you're going to push it. Oh, and by the way, watch the cardiac monitor when you're doing it. I thought the ICU nurse was going to fall off the chair. She's like. But if their kidneys are not functioning, how do you tell a 16-year-old that in 5 to 15 years, she will be on dialysis herself the rest of her life and needing a kidney transplant because of the destruction to the kidneys. But that's okay because nothing ever happens in OB. She's 16. She's healthy. She can do this. Her research is focusing on... Um, hey, Betsy, can you hear me? Yeah. Did you it's go out Paula. again? No, hey, it's Paula. Paula. But she, did you know she had another baby? Yep. I wasn't sure if you heard about that. Oh, yeah, I did. I, she, we saw her down in uh, testing. Oh, I nice. looked at the okay. name and I went, okay, wait. Well, this is one of the good things about Epic. You can go back in the notes. There's my note. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because right, that was just my little tidbit. That's all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember her. That's the special thing. I mean, because like we, I ran it like an ICU in there. In fact, when we went in to clean, I had three progress notes lined up with all my little med bottles next to them, even though they were scanned in because I said, do not touch those till I double check to make sure everything went in in the right order in the right sequence. I thought my charge nurse was like, leave her alone. <laughs> this, you know, because you're a little OCD when you take care of these people. We gave a drug called Manitol. I hadn't given that since my student days in ICU. Because the one renal guy that came in before we moved her, he's like, you need to give her Manitol. I said, there's a drug I haven't heard in a long time. Preeclampsia and its link to stroke. Can baby aspirin help? When we have our moms with the baby aspirin, Oh, okay, because, you know, this thing was beeping and I didn't, never mind. Okay. We give baby aspirin during the pregnancy, but what do we do at 36, 37 weeks? Stop the baby aspirin. Why? Because we don't want them to bleed. And it's done its job. 
And again, these are the ones that are at significant risk for stroke and cardiovascular disease in the next five to 10 years. And guess what? They're the ones that don't get that cardiac consult. And also, these are the women that should be on baby aspirin after they're done having babies. But guess what? They're not. Because again, we aren't paying attention to us, to the older women. Chronic hypertension, pre existing diagnosis of hypertension. Proteinuria may already be there because she's hypertensive. She may have renal damage. Proteinuria is going to get worse during the course of the pregnancy. It is the most complicated because we're trying to find the sweet spot in dealing with this young lady. But we usually define it as new onset proteinuria, sudden escalation of the blood pressure previously controlled, and the appearance of the severe symptoms. Here's our friend eclampsia. Okay. Ah. Boy, that popped up fast. It's the presence of grand mal seizures or onset of coma. How many here have ever walked into a patient who's comatose? Scariest thing you'll ever see because you're trying to, hey, because you're not in the room every second of your shift. She's previously talking to you, or as we refer to her sometimes on Mag, she's a little Maggie. Uh, they're really kind of like, what'd you give me? And they're a little kind of like, whoa. You try to lift their arm and they're like in slow motion. The incidence, four to five out of every 10,000 vaginal deliveries. 50% occur prior to the delivery, 79%. Where's my postpartum people? You're not off the hook, kids. 79% occur late, 48 hours up to four weeks. 93% neo mortality if it's prior to 28 weeks, because those little ones can't handle what's going on inside the uterus at the time of a seizure. Um, the uterus will become rock hard. You may see high frequency contractions. You've got fetal bradycardia for three to 10 minutes, then lates and variables, maybe tachycardia. In the old days, we used to call it an overshoot. Literally, you're watching the, heart, uh, the baby's heart rate shoot up because it's trying to accommodate what just went on. Um, you're gonna watch for an abruption because you don't always see them. They can be what we call a cult. It's up above and maybe the head's presenting and guess what can't get out? Not even amniotic fluid. So the blood's backed up behind it. You do not want to run down the hall with this young lady because where in the hallway is your suction? Where are your emergency equipment? Where's your oxygen? Stay in the room and let the baby resuscitate. You will pull the call light out of the wall and call an OB rapid response. Get your people in the room. You cannot do this by yourself. That's uh, an abruption. What is the treatment? Mag. You get them on mag. If they're not already, if they're get, if you're just starting it and you're running your bolus, you might have to give her a little more because what you want is that mag level up. You can also give Versed or Ativan, but mag is your primary. Eclampsia is a form of press, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Say that in the morning without a cup of coffee where the blood pressure literally causes the cerebral edema. And this is the one that if you do an MRI, it's complete white out on the screen. MAG causes relaxation and vasodilatation of the, of the uh, smooth muscle. And we think it limits the, the edema formation. We don't know for sure. We just know it works. And by the way, the first article written on the use of mag sulfate for the treatment of 
Toxemia, remember in the old days, that's what it was called, was published in 1918. But when did we start using it in mainstream therapy? Late 60s at Parkland Memorial down in Dallas. And at Parkland, you may hear what's called the Parkland Protocol. Two grams IM in the butt every hour. Because back then, we did not do IV stuff. I didn't start using it in my career until... 1976. Think of all the people that died, and we didn't we didn't have the information. It sat on a shelf, and they found it in the late 60s and felt it would work. You ask a neurologist how it works; they they can't tell you either. Um. If you can join this organization, CMQCC, it's the California Maternal uh, Quality uh, Something Committee. I think it might be. Yeah. Anyway, it's free. Any policy written today in the United States, whether it be from New York to California, CMQCC is the basis. They've done the research. They've given you a nice outlined policy. It's the basis for the majority of the policies here at Innova. Why should we reinvent the wheel when someone's already done it? And if you go on that website, they offer webinars, seminars. The key word here is free. You just have to sign up. With your email, I was get. Um, they're the ones that have done postpartum hemorrhage. They did a huge thing on COVID delivery at 39 weeks, cardiovascular disease in women. There is a ton of stuff that these people have, including free patient handouts. It's wonderful, but this is the algorithm for eclampsia. It's in the policy as well. What are our hypertensive meds? There are four of them that are safe in pregnancy. The ones that have the little stars, the procardial, labetalol, and apresoline are part of the emergent hypertensive order set. Remember I said we have to respond if it's 160 over 110 two times in a row every 10 minutes. Now, why am I saying every 10 minutes? What's your standard when you're on labor delivery and you're doing labor and while it, uh, you know, all that other good stuff? Your blood pressure cuff is set on how many minutes? Every 15. When you have a hypertensive patient, switch your timing to every 10. Why? Two of those drugs are given every 20 minutes and another one is given every 10. Well, where does 15 fall in that? I don't know, when I went to school, that's not, you know, if you're on every 15 minutes and the blood, the med's supposed to begin at every 10, you're either five minutes late or five minutes early. So put your cuff on every 10 minutes. You get to, you're on the phone. Get your orders moving. And don't let the doctor tell you to turn around her left side. Normal physiologic process semi fowlers at the level of the heart. Even if she's pregnant, you've got a little bit of a tilt. This is the part that's tilted, not this. But if you turn them over all the way and you're taking the blood pressure in this arm, the arm is above the level of the heart, therefore it will be lower. You're pushing drugs. You may not, you may be missing stuff and not responding to those blood pressure readings. Does that make sense? Aldamin, it's an old drug. It's been around longer than I have, but it's a workhorse and it's cheap. Uh, the problem is you cannot get a blood level for 24 to 48 hours. Therefore, it is not usable in an emergency situation. Procardia, calcium channel blocker. Dosing is uh, 20 milligrams or 30, 60, 90 XL. It is safe in pregnancy. You can give it with mag sulfate. 
because you know mag sulfate is also a calcium channel blocker. The thing keeps going off. So one of the concerns was that I can't give it because I'm already giving mag. Yeah, you can. In 2015, the docs wrote a technical bulletin on it saying, yes, you can give it. Do not chew or pierce the capsule. Back in the 80s, when Procardia first came out, we would stick a needle in it and put it sublingual. And uh, we used to bottom their pressures to like 90 over 60. That's not cool. And in fact, when they were doing the study in Australia, um, they were killing a few women. I don't like that. Okay, we have enough emergencies in our world. We don't need to add more to the list. So make sure she can swallow it. What's nice is she comes in, you can't get a line started. And the doc can give you this one or Lavenlaw that she can take orally until you can get someone in to get that line started. It also has a mild diuretic effect. One of the other things too, when you're taking a mom off mag, ask the doctor, do you want her to put her on something? Because once the mag is out of their system, usually 12 to 18 hours, mag is completely out of your system. If she's up on postpartum, guess who's getting a phone call? Her blood pressure's now 160 over 102. Well, did we put her on anything after we took her off the mag to help control her blood pressure? If mag worked in lowering their pressure, which of course that's not why we're giving it, but it is a calcium channel blocker, you will start to see that effect. Make sure mom's on something when you shut the mag off. Procardia works really nice, especially in our African-American in our brown population. We don't know why. Labetalol, we're usually on really super high dosing regimens for it to work. But you put a mom, African-American mom on Procardia, it works much better. Labetalol is an alpha beta blocker. The reason why they like to use it is the beta blocker offers neuroprotection to mom. We've already got a mom with maybe some possible cerebral symptoms occurring due to uh, the preeclampsia, but the labetalol is wonderful. If mom is a diabetic and you've got her on labetalol, she will not show that she is hypoglycemic until she's well into the toilet. And you hold the pulse on any beta blocker if the pulse is below 60. Apresiline, hydrolysine, still my favorite drug. I love it. It's a vasodilator because remember what's going on with the blood vessels. They're spasming like this and your blood pressure is going like this. So you get that quiet, quieted down and you do get to see a relaxation and that blood pressure start to come down. Depending, I was going to look this up before I came in, but at last look, uh, Alex cannot push IV apresoline or IV labetalol unless you're on a cardiac monitor. 2019, ACOG said you don't need a cardiac monitor if you are. But remember, you have a policy. Well, we used to call them policy books. You have a policy site. And depending on the hospital you're working at, you should pull up what are the high-risk meds and what can you do at your hospital? Unfortunately, there are differences among the four hospitals. This is an algorithm of the hypertensive protocol. You can see labetalol is the 10 minute one. Hydrolysine is um, the 20 minute one. That's why your pressure cycle needs to be every 10. Again, this is for the people that like to read words. I don't, I'm an algorithm. High-risk drug, two RN verifiers, calcium channel blocker on the mag, four to six gram bolus followed by two gram an hour. That is your standard. And IV solutions are standardized across the country. Mag, pit. Mag is the thousand CC bag with 40 grams so that our math and calculations always stay the same. It is a safety thing, came from IHS, God, back in 2008, I think. 
It's seizure prophylaxis, not to lower the blood pressure, although it is a calcium channel blocker, so you always know it's starting to work because you see the pressure starting to go down. You've got to know what her serum creatinine is because mag is excreted through the kidneys. If she ain't peeing, her mag levels will go up higher and faster. And you can use labetalol and nifedipine on mag to help keep that blood pressure. That's a mag bag. You've heard, uh, you've heard your senior nurses call it, get the mag bag, mag bag. Maybe that'll be my nickname or my handle. Hi, I'm mag bag. <laughs> These are your levels. Uh, any conv convulsion pro uh, properties are anywhere between five to eight. And trust me, when they're eight, they're Maggie. They're like, okay, oh, can I have the baby now? Uh, speaking of babies and being on Mag, unless someone's in the room, you don't leave that baby there. That baby starts choking. How can you? Okay, I'll go get it. Really? She's responsible? No. A family member needs to be in the room if the baby's there. That's common sense safety. Um, that's the vasospasms, what can occur, because remember, the blood pressure is going up and down. It's due to the vasospasms. Body cascade, simply put, endothelial disruption causes the vessels to leak out. We see it as edema. Platelets go, hey, we got a leak over here. So they all go running over to plug the site. Your blood pressure goes up because the vessels realize they're losing pressure so the blood vessels will vasoconstrict, the pressure goes up, the clotting cascade kicks out, that's our friend fibrinogen. Now, if you want the different factors with the arrows on a chart that's three times this size and you can't figure out where to even start it, I can get you a copy. This is, simply put, in your brain so you know what's happening. Fiber mesh work comes over, plasmin will trim out the fibrinogen, because if you ever saw fibrinogen on an electron microscope, it's a stick, like big sticks. You'll see the FSPs or the FDPs, which are the fragments from the fibrinogen filtering out. If you've got elevated FDP, she's a sick puppy. Welcome to the health syndrome. Hemolysis, elevated liver, and low platelets, which is why you need to know what your norms are so that you know you're heading into trouble. Now, the biggest one for hemolysis is you get an elevated serum bilirubin because bilirubin is part of the breakdown of the cells. The little red blood cells that have been lysed, broken up as it's filtering through, run back to the liver and say, hey, refurbish me. But you gotta remember there's so much lysis that's gone on the liver's on overload, which is why you see the elevated liver enzymes, because they just threw the production into overtime and they brought on three extra shifts to try to work it out. So your liver enzymes go through the roof with your elevated ALT, AST, and LDH. And then the platelets are being exhausted because they're plugging up all the holes all over First identified 1985. We actually sent these women to hematologists because we couldn't figure out what was going on. Occurs in 20% of your preeclamptic diagnoses. This is preeclampsia with severe features. This is the one that when you see, now remember when you're looking at labs, one lab test does not make the diagnosis. You've got to see other pieces to the puzzle. Does that make sense? Because you can walk around with low platelets and it's called ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, or gestational, gestational ITP. We don't know why it starts, but that's the only level that's down are the platelets. DIC, okay, kids, if we're playing with DIC, we're in big trouble. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, just get help. And that's uh, pictures of the, uh, the blood escaping out through the vessel wall. Okay, labs for labor and delivery. Now, guess what? We share these with our friends at the rest of the hospital. This is not just exclusively us. The only thing that we can count as exclusively us is a pregnancy test. 
All right, so CBC, CMP, that's what we used to call it. Coags, your PT, PTT, fibrinogen, FDP, your UA, your urine culture, 24-hour urine, PCRs, type and screen. Okay, now what I do with this is that um, when you get a CBC, do not misunderstand what I'm saying. That whole thing is important. But you need to critically think fast. What applies to me? What do I need to do? What for do I need to look at? White cap, hemoglobin, crit, and platelets. Everything else is important. Yes. But it's not as definitive as these four guys. So white cap should be between 5 to 11.5. Because she is pregnant. Moms will run a mild leukocytosis. So our white count in our population runs just a smidge higher due to our friends' cortisol and estrogen. Okay? But if it is elevated, is she in labor? I don't know about you, but when I was in labor, it was very stressful. So I'm releasing cortisol, therefore my white count is going up. Does that make sense? So the 32 weeker that comes in contracting better than the 40 weeker induction down the hall and is uncomfortable, look at her CBC. I can guarantee you her white count is elevated. Okay, start the algorithm in your brain. CBC comes back with an elevated white count. She's contracting. She's 32 weeks. What are... What would be another lab test we're going to do ASAP? How about a urine? Biggest reason why people contract, do they have a UTI? Because the uterus and the bladder share the same space. The one irritates the other. Does she have an infection? So the white cat would be up for two reasons, an infection and she's contracting. But what does that urine say? So do you see where the algorithm starts? You start taking steps. Labor, infection, and our friend, betamethasone. We give betamethasone from what week to what week? What are the dates? When would we give it the first time? Starting at what point in gestation? No. Young lady said 32. We will start when there's possibility of delivery, 500 grams or above, so we could be 22 to 23 weeks. When do we stop giving it? Someone said it over there. Say it. 37 weeks. We do not give beta after 37 weeks. 12 milligrams beta methasone, so less, so less, well, I can't. Beta methasone, 12 milligrams, followed by a second dose, 12 milligrams, 24 hours later. You can use dexamethasone. However, it's short acting and you have to give four doses. We used, we had it as a backup when we ran, we had a shortage of beta. Um, but the, the key one that you want to give is beta methasone. Um, we used to stop it at 34 weeks, but we extended it to 37 due to late preterm babies. So that elevates your white count. Beta methasone will elevate two other lab tests. So we've got white count. What's the other one that goes up? It's a steroid. One lab goes up with steroids. Uh, huh? Uh, Excellent. Glucose. What's the other one that goes up? Platelets. So if you gave mom betamethasone and you've got her as an AP patient, what test are you not going to do? How about your screening for gestational diabetes? Because beta will affect that test for at least one week. So she's 28 weeks. She was supposed to get her one hour test. And now she's here with you on the AP side of the world with P. She's P prompt. And bless her heart, her doctor will say, well, we're going to give her her beta methasone, her um, glucose test. Um, excuse me, doctor, she had beta methasone on Tuesday. Can you schedule that for next Tuesday? 
Oh. Because otherwise it's wasted. And if you've ever drank that glucola, I have patients that vomit from it. It is not pleasant. All right, your hemoglobin and hematocrit should be 10 and 30. Why? Moms carry extra fluid because they're pregnant. Let's use round numbers so our brains can work and do the math easy. If I took one of these young ladies and poured all the fluid out into a bucket, let's just say we have 10 liters of fluid. When you are pregnant, that increases to 14 to 15 liters. You almost have more amount. Why? You're growing a baby. You need, it's a two people system. You got to get the nutrients in and the waste out. And it's growing at the fastest rate of growth that the human body will ever grow. So you got to get it in and get it out. So you need that extra fluid. So moms develop what we call physiologic anemia. Why? Because the, they have the same number of red cells. They're just a little more dilute. Make sense? So hemoglobin and hematocrit, 10 and 30 is about the lowest you're going to go. Your red blood cells to hemoglobin to hematocrit is a one to three ratio. So if your red blood cells are four, because you know down in the ER, they can check that like a little glucometer thing and it goes in the machine and it says you have... Uh, your uh, RBC count is four. <coughs> what would be your hemoglobin if it's four? If it's one to three? Well, four times three is 12. Last time I went and did math, yeah. Your hematocrit should be 12 times three, 36. So you got to know the relationship of your numbers. Platelets greater than 150,000. The platelets will be elevated and significantly. I'll show you on a lab test what it actually did. So be aware. Some of the docs, I've heard him say, oh, she's getting better. No, honey, she has help. We're just in the honeymoon. Because it elevated them, giving us 48 hours till we can get them delivered. Potassium, when you have orders to do a chemistry, there's a test in EPIC called the PIH panel. It's lovely. It looks at ALT, AST, creatinine, uric acid, uh, creatinine, and one other. It's a nice after you've done the big workup, because what you want to do is get the big chemistry so you know what you're up against. Patients who are chronic hypertensives will hang on to their potassium in the cells. It won't be circulating. I've had instances where they have come in and their serum potassium is 2.2. Now, I don't know about you, but potassium needs to be 3.5 to 4. But had I done the PIH panel, I wouldn't have known what that potassium is. Potassium at 2.4, even in a, anybody, is dangerous. So you've got to know your labs. Serum creatinine, 0. 0.6. Remember, it's your kidney function. I don't care how pregnant she is, if she just came from IHOP eating the short stack, with at least a bottle of syrup on top of it, her glucose should not be above 120. If it's above, do you have your glucose test? No, I couldn't stand that stuff. I'm like, mm -hmm, okay. Now you got to figure out. Or did she have beta? Do you ever look at them on the screen? The betas, you know, <laughs> lovely stuff. That's why our diabetics are covered sometimes with some little extra hits of regular when we've done their when the, we've done their finger sticks. Um, uric acid. It is a soft call lab. It is not diagnostic like a white count or ALT, AST. But what it's basically saying is that the blood pressure has been rising behind the scenes. You just didn't catch all of the elevated ones. For example, 
Uh, on Friday afternoon, she gets sent over from the office because the office, if they send lab work out, they won't see it till Monday. And better yet, you throw in the federal holiday on Monday, they won't see it till Tuesday. So if she's getting sick, there's four days that she's being sick. So they come to labor and delivery triage because what happens on labor and delivery? How fast do we get labs? What is the national standard for stat labs across the country? How long does the lab have to take if it's a stat? One hour, national standard. Now there are labs that because of whatever they do, they don't return such as bile acids, they're four to five days because they run them in batches. But if you do a stat lab, labor and delivery has two speeds, stat and normal. <laughs> so anything stat is one hour. But uric acid is funny because as it's creeping up, maybe the first time she's in triage, it's 3.2. And her blood pressure, the first one was 138 over 90. So it's kind of a little elevated, but not worrisome. She comes in two weeks later. It's now 4.2. This time her blood pressure is 142 over 92. Not scary, but what's going on? Two weeks after that, she hits the door with a blood uh, with a ur uric acid of six, and her blood pressure is now. 164 over 108. So the lab test is climbing slowly behind the scenes saying, pay attention over here, her blood pressure is going up. And there's our ALT, AST. If, like I said, if one of these lab tests is elevated, you need the whole picture to figure out what's going on. Because I've had patients come in with elevated liver enzymes, normal blood pressure, normal platelets, but she's from Thailand. Thailand is known endemically for chronic hepatitis B. So you've got to work up some other things. This is one of the nice, oh, there it is. California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. I knew it was not committee. But anyway, these are the different things that you can look at. Uh, this is one of their slides, it's phenomenal. Uh, but it shows where the labs are going up and down when you're trying to differentiate between all these fun diagnoses. Because you think preeclampsia is the big one, then we have help. Then we have um, antiphospholipid, uh, TTP, Haas. That's a scary one. Because when you start looking at the labs, they look like preeclampsia, but there's a couple things that will differentiate them. Then you're getting the ICU people involved. Coagulation profile, if you remember anything today, fibrinogen is your friend. We look at the fibrinogen, I'm gonna go with that. The rest of them, it just depends on what else is going, what else is going on. Your fibrinogen in pregnancy should be greater than 400. And I developed a little, kind of like a little reminder, sing song thing that you can play in your brain when you're looking at this. So if the fibrinogen number starts with an F number, four, five, you can throw the kitchen sink at this girl. She's going to hang in there with you because fibrinogen is a backup reserve for your platelets. So they're not chewing up. The fibrinogen isn't getting chewed up and being used because something's going on at that cellular level that you may or may not see. The fibrinogen number that starts with a T, two, or three, you're in trouble. What's going on? Why is she burning up the fibrinogen? The fibrinogen that starts with an O, which is 100 or less, is, I used to teach this up at Catholic University, so I had to clean up the word, but we all know what we want to say here. If you remember anything today, fibrinogen is your friend. Platelets and platelets, fibrinogen and DIC and HELP syndrome. Basically, they look the same, 
except your fibrinogen is low in DIC because they're bleeding out and tanking, but it's high in health because she's pregnant. The body is accommodating what could possibly happen. Pregnancy is a hypercoagulative state because you know we do D-dimers to measure to see if a person has pulmonary embolism, one small problem. If you are pregnant and you do a D-dimer, it's elevated. So is that a differential diagnosis for a PE? No. You got to take it down a few more steps because you don't know. Is it due to the pregnancy or she's got a clot sitting somewhere? So trying to make the diagnosis in pregnancy is a little tricky. Fatty liver. That's why I said make sure you do the big chemistry so you know what you're up against. Because with fatty liver, your glucose is kind of in low, and I do mean low, and your ammonia is high. And back in the day, we used to do liver biopsies. God, why these people didn't die, I will never know. There must have been angels sitting on all of our shoulders back then. Um, but we used to do liver biopsies, which is a big no-no <laughs> today. Um, bile acids, 0 to 39, is normal, although patients are symptomatic, sometimes around 20. What is bile acids uh, used to diagnose? What do we use it to diagnose? Patient comes in and she's scratching her palms and her feet. What are we diagnosing? Buccholestasis related but it's cholestasis, all right? Drug used to treat uracidol or actigol, 300 milligrams, two to three times a day, reduces the itching. Uh, if it's over 40, that's now technically the diagnosis. The diagnosis used to be made, anything over 20, they've now changed it. If they're up in the 80s, we're talking delivery because there's an increased risk of stillborn after 30 to 37 weeks. When we started putting the sepsis stuff together, um, oh God, it's been at least 10 years. Uh, when we started putting the sepsis screen out, they wanted to lump us in the world with the rest of our friends at the hospital. And we said no, because if our patients did a sepsis, if our patients came in, we would do a sepsis workup on 75% of the people walking in labor and delivery by virtue of our vital signs because our moms can go up to 110, 120. The respiratory rate, because remember, short, shallow breathing, the diaphragm goes four to seven centimeters up into the chest. So moms are sh more shallow breathing, therefore a higher respiratory rate. So we kind of argued the point. That's why you have a OB sepsis screen because people like myself and a few of the other educators went, ah, kibosh, no, nope, we're not doing that. The only thing we did not have current data on, because you know you don't want to experiment on women, especially if they're pregnant, was what is a normal lactic acid? So we borrowed this from our friends in the critical care. We gave them that credit. So anything one to two is normal. However, two to four, we now have diminished tissue perfusion. And anything above four, we have tissue hypoxia and death. What patient can walk in, what diagnosis can walk in that's septic? Anybody? How about the patient with no prenatal care and comes in and says, this stuff's leaking out of me. It's brown. So anybody in labor and delivery, you see brown fluid leaking out. What are you thinking? Uh-huh. Intertense 101. So she's p prom, heroin prematurity. Oh, you guys are going to have fun. And she's tacky at 130. You put the baby on the monitor. What's the other thing you're going to do if mom's tacking away at 130? What are you going to put on her finger? Because you could be tracing mom on the EFM if she has a fever. So get that pulse ox on. 
Make sure you got two little people tracing. Okay. But that's one person, prolonged PPROM. What's another one that walks in? How about pylo? Pylonephritis. What's our big causative organism there? How about our friend E. coli? It's very special. They shake so hard that the bed rattles. You can stand outside the room and hear the bed rattling. The chills are so bad. So that is sepsis. We are going to do aggressive fluid resuscitation because if your lactic acid is above four, the reason why we lose people is due to severe hypotension. So how are we going to get that pressure up? We're going to be pushing in the crystalloids. Uh, the HESI starches should be nowhere near an OB unit. That's... Um, the anesthesia people like those, but they shouldn't be anywhere on OB. We are not going to delay those antibiotics if you can't get the culture within 45 minutes. Broad spectrum, definitely within that first hour to cover um, the standard bad bugs that are out there. You're going to check your cultures daily. Vanderbilt recommends the use of IV uh, balanced fluids, in other words, lactator ringers over normal saline because has less kidney damage. And Norfolk Sentara, this came out back in 2017, started using um, steroids, vitamin C, and thiamine for the treatment of severe sepsis. Uh, they did a small study. Uh, unfortunately, it was not replicated elsewhere, but it gave them hope because steroids, vitamin C, and thiamine, guess what? We can give that in pregnancy. Because when you're pregnant, we run into a problem of what can we treat mom with? Because there are some antibiotics that you can't give mom. It is still a medical emergency. That's why we have the sepsis protocols. A UA. Mommy, here, pee in the cup. I put those cups down on the table. The first thing I do, I get down, I take a look. How much water are you drink today? I had two bottles today. How big were the bottles? They're little tiny, little stubby ones. She should be drinking between a half to a gallon of water a day. Remember, we got to maintain that extra four liters of fluid. And when that four liters of fluid starts to drop, guess what that uterus starts doing? Yeet, 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 starts contracting. So mama got a drink. Specific gravity should be 001. Or I tell moms, if you see any yellow in your toilet, you are not drinking enough. Lukes should be negative if they're small, moderate, or large. Those are pre-white cells. Are we playing with a bladder infection? Nitrite should be negative if it's positive. Hello, E. coli. That's one of the biggest telltale signs that your culture is going to be positive. So you've got nitrites. Blood should be negative. If it's positive, what sits next to the urethra down there in our private parties? What sits there? Ladies, we work in labor and delivery and postpartum. What's right next to that spot? How about the sacred space, otherwise known as the vagina? <laughs> and what can come out of our vaginas? Blood, semen, a whole lot of other stuff, nasty creatures. You know, you got to, you know, patients come in, you got to take a look between the legs, see what's going on. Where is it coming from? We had a patient once arrived by rescue squad. I mean, we were tearing loose. We had everything ready because she's bleeding. Literally, she walked in, I grabbed her pants, we pulled them down fast. You know where she is bleeding from? She had a varicosity on her labia that decided to break. And man, those suckers pump. But there was no blood coming out of the sacred space. Or the night that patient came in in the wheelchair and she's dripping blood down the hall. So we go flying with her into the bed. Guess where the bleeding was coming from? 
not the sacred space. But when we turned her over, she had a rectal laceration with roids. And guess who had to go to the OR and get it repaired? Because the little friend wanted to have sex, and she was 32 weeks and had been treated for preterm labor. So we told her nothing in the vagina because that can initiate, intercourse can initiate sex. or. Um, contractions so he backdoored her so you gotta you, you gotta check all your spaces make sure nothing gets missed so if you see blood is she in labor because she might have bloody show in the urine or if she's 32 weeks and there's blood and nothing else how about the patient that comes in the door with severe renal colic, trying to pass a kidney stone. As that's trying to move, it's gonna release blood into her urine. Protein, we've gone over. Your 24-hour urine and creatinine clearance. Uh, we don't really look at the clearances anymore, but we know about our total protein because we know about the new tests we do for preeclampsia. Here we go. Here's our PCRs. It is a reasonable rule out test. If the PCR is 0 0.3, 10 to 1, she is hypertensive. Again, a spot test. If it's less than 0.15, it excludes proteinuria with a 99% sensitivity rate. If it's greater than 0 0.6, it has a 96% percent specificity. Obviously, if you have time, get the 24-hour urine collection, because what happens if, depending on what time of day the urine is obtained, if she's a one plus urine, you might get a 0.3, but if it's trace, you might get 0.1. So if you have the time to get the diagnosis with a 24-hour collection, please do. Technically, um, it's an indeterminate, but some right now it's what we've got. Uh, the nephrologists are thrilled. But remember, the nephrologist patients, they've got such kidney damage that their numbers are always the same. They're always steady. Does that make sense? They're, they're not running up and down like our group of ladies. These are actual PCR results in the computer. And the thing I want to show you, you'll get what the urine is for the protein and the urine creatinine. And basically, there is a calculation that they do that gets you what the PCR is. And if you're ever, like, you really need to look at this, Go to a website called perinatology.com and, you know, in the search, look for protein creatinine ratio. And it will come over and you can actually see what, double check the PCR listing. Now, look at the top one. You see what it says? Highlighted in yellow, unable to calculate. When we did this, we started doing regular urines with the PCRs because we wanted to see, make sure what kind of a correlation is going on there. Her initial dip on the urine was greater than three plus, but they're telling me they're unable to calculate it. And the reason why you see that elevated sign and the less that or and the greater than sign in front of the creatinine. If you plug those numbers into the PCR calculation, the top one had a PCR result of 3.65. So definitely diagnosed with preclension. You can't argue with the number one or above, not 0.1, okay? Or an estimated, um, 24 hour urine collection, they can estimate it that it's going to show close to five grams of protein. Are we over 300 in that one? Yes. 
The second one here, you'll see the less than, what was, is that, yeah. Less than seven and 25.4. If you plug that one in, that one comes out to, um, but it's it's less than seven, so basically it's negligible. Um, but if you wanted to play with it and take the greater than or less than signs, it comes out to 0 0.2 or a 24 hour collection of 318. So there are resources because a nurse actually called the physician and said, her PCR is negative on that top one, but it wasn't when we went back and recalculated it and we went on and treated her. So you got to know how the numbers are obtained to make sure things are working. We're going to look at some actual lab results. This is an old CBC. This came from a system prior to GEC uh, prior to EPIC called GECE centricity. Um, and this is how it used to, okay, I'm gonna date myself. We didn't have the computers like we do today, click on labs, boom, there everything is. They would fax these up to us, um, fax machine, that's how we used to get lab results on all of our patients. Hey, we were high tech. <laughs> Because the other way was the lab person had to literally run it up to the floor. How about them apples? Those lab ladies really got their, their steps in in an eight hour shift with us. So remember, like I said, over here on the side, you got your normal ranges. Remember that's the adult male, not our group of ladies. So you see how much stuff comes up? Yeah, all of it's important, but not to you because you want four pieces out of this. What are they? They're highlighted. White count, hemoglobin, vanacrit, platelets. White count, what's her white count? Shout it out. 2.9. What's her hemoglobin? Okay, what's her plate? Uh, Habanacrit. What's her platelets? Okay, you remember that your numbers should be one to three. So if your hemoglobin is 20, your crit should be around 60. So 58.5, okay, we're in the ballpark. So at least we know that part. But on a pregnant woman, can you have a white count of 2.9? What's a white count of 2.9 usually signify? White count of 3.2.9. How about leukemia? You're on the right track, but wrong lab test. <laughs> so leukemia, can we diagnose leukemia? Oh yeah, we have, scared the bejeevus on us on a Saturday night. Lab test came up over the computer. We literally called the lab and said, can you run it again? We sent them another specimen. We called them again, are you sure? We called the physician. He wanted a third one. I said, no, we've done it twice already. We're getting the same results. Called Hemonkin. Okay, Saturday night at five o'clock, we're calling Hemonkin. We were going to send her home because she came in because she just didn't feel good. She's 31 weeks. Everything up to this point had been fine. Gave her two shots of beta methasone. We had a C-section Tuesday morning so that we could start chemo. Got the baby delivered. They didn't want to wait. But this was close to probably about 20 years ago. So I'm sure medications, treatment might have changed, but back then it was significant. And the only reason we knew it is someone walked over to the fax machine, picked up the fax, looked at it, and said, this doesn't look right. And then showed it to, you know, we're all sitting there looking at it. Someone had the wherewithal to call the lab and said, are you sure? And before, and this was when we delivered the lab, P 